In this video tutorial, we're going to introduce Steam Power Plant, and in particular, we're going to be looking at the components or the devices that are typically included in Steam Power Plant. We're also going to look at the theoretical Steam cycles that are used to represent this type of system. And by representing the system in this way, we can determine things such as power in, power out, heat in, heat out, and overall efficiency of the system. So to begin with then, the components in our steam power plant, first of all we have either a compressor or a pump, and this is going to be dependent on the type of cycle that we're using to model the system, as we'll see later in this video. The compressor or the pump is used to do work on the steam or the water. We use a compressor if we have steam, and we use a pump if we have water. Now by doing work on the steam or the water, what we actually do is increase its pressure. Now each of these processes are modelled as reversible adiabatic or isentropic processes, and what that means is the entropy before the compressor or the pump is the same as the entropy after the compressor or pump. So the formula that's used to determine the work input is the mass of water or steam passing through the device multiplied by the enthalpy change as we go through that device. The next device in the system then is the boiler. And as you'll see later, we can have a boiler that heats steam, or we can have a boiler that's broken down into various components, an economizer that's used to heat water, an evaporator that then evaporates that water and converts it into steam, and a superheater that superheats the steam after it's reached its dry saturation point. So in both instances, the boiler is used to input heat to the steam or the water. Now the assumption that we make here is that the heat input process is a constant pressure process and the way that we calculate the heat into the system is the mass of water or steam passing through the boiler multiplied by the change in enthalpy as we go through the boiler. So the enthalpy at the exit of the boiler minus the enthalpy at the entrance of the boiler. The next component in the cycle then is the turbine and in the turbine we expand the steam and in doing so, the steam does work on the turbine or causes the turbine to turn. Now, the sole purpose of our steam power plant is to take heat energy and convert it into mechanical work. So in our boiler, we'll have a combustion process which produces heat. That heat is used to heat our steam or heat our water. And we then expand our steam in the turbine in order to produce mechanical work. Now once again the assumption here is that we have a reversible adiabatic or constant entropy process and the way that we calculate the work out this time is the mass of steam passing through the turbine multiplied by the change in enthalpy of the steam as it passes through the turbine. So the final component in our cycle then is our condenser and the condenser is used to condense the steam. So what we're doing there is we're removing heat from the steam in order to convert it back to water. And we'll see this in a moment when we look at the schematic diagrams for these cycles. Once again, the assumption is that this happens at constant pressure. So the pressure at the inlet and outlet of the condenser are equal. And the way that we calculate the heat output is the mass of steam or water passing through the condenser multiplied by the change in enthalpy as we go through the condenser. So next then, we need to consider how we represent this steam power plant so that we can carry out various calculations. The first model that's used to represent steam plant is the Carnot cycle. And on the left hand side we have a schematic diagram of the Carnot cycle. Note that going from 1 to 2 we're passing through a compressor. And the reason we're passing through a compressor is because we have wet steam there. We don't have water. From 2 to 3 we're passing through the boiler. So we're heating that wet steam until it becomes dry steam. 3 to 4 then we have the turbine where we expand that steam in order to do mechanical work. And finally we have our condenser. Now if we refer to our temperature entropy diagram on the right hand side, we start our cycle at position 1 at the entrance to the compressor. Now recall that anything under this curve here is steam. Anything to the left of the curve is water. And anything to the right of the curve is superheated steam. So what we can see here is throughout this cycle, we have saturated steam. At position 1 then, we have steam with a relatively high moisture content. Recall that if we're on the line here, we have wet saturated steam. And if we're on the line here, we have dry saturated steam. 
And anywhere in between, we have a dryness fraction. So if we have a dryness fraction of 90%, somewhere around here, then we have 90% steam and 10% water. Whereas if we're over on this side, let's say we have a dryness fraction of 10%, then we have 90% water and only 10% steam. A dryness fraction of 10% means our steam is only 10% dry and 90% wet. So at position one, we have steam with a very low dryness fraction. So as we go through the compressor, we compress that steam and we compress that steam until it becomes wet saturated vapor. So wet saturated vapor is where we're on that transition point between water and steam. So wet saturated vapor would have a dryness fraction of zero. In this theoretical cycle, then we pass through the boiler and we pass through the boiler until we end up with a dry saturated steam with a dryness fraction of 100%. And we then expand our steam through the turbine and in doing so we create mechanical work. And as we do mechanical work, the temperature of the steam drops until we return to position four at the entrance of the condenser. So once again, we have steam here with a relatively high dryness fraction but nonetheless, it's still a wet vapor. Our wet steam then passes through the condenser, its dryness fraction decreases, but we still have wet steam at position one. The dryness fraction is lower, therefore it has a higher moisture content than at position four. A couple of other things we notice then from our temperature entropy diagram is that our compression from positions one to position two and our expansion from position three to four are isentropic constant entropy process. S3 equals S4, as we can see, because this line here is vertical. And S1 equals S2, once again, because the line is vertical and it would give us the same reference point on our entropy axis here. So let's look at some of the characteristics of that Carnot cycle. Well, first of all, the Carnot cycle gives us the maximum efficiency for steam power plant or for a steam cycle. And the reason being is that all of the processes there are either reversible or isentropic or constant temperature processes. So therefore the Carnot cycle represents the maximum efficiency for this type of power plant. What we may wish to do is compare the efficiency of a ranking cycle to a Carnot cycle to see how close those efficiencies actually are. Some of the disadvantages with the Carnot cycle though is that we have low net power output. And the reason being there is because we have a dry saturated steam entering the turbine. If we were to superheat that steam, then its enthalpy would be higher. And when we expanded that steam, we would create more mechanical work. So although we have a maximum efficiency, we have a low net power output. Another complication with the Carnot cycle is that compressing wet steam isn't really practical. As we saw from the previous slide, the moisture content at position one or entering the compressor was very high. And when we compress that steam, the water tends to separate, which can actually fill the compressor. So what we have there is a bit of a problem because the steam has a very high moisture content. Now, another disadvantage is that the steam we're expanding in our turbine becomes very wet and that wet steam causes corrosion of the turbine blades. So although theoretically the Carnot cycle gives us maximum efficiency, there are some practical problems associated with that cycle. So an alternative cycle that can be adopted is the ideal ranking cycle. The first thing that we know is moving from position one to position two, we have a pump instead of a compressor. As we'll see in a moment, the reason for that is because we have water at position one and we have water at position two. So we use a pump to pump water, whereas we use a compressor to compress steam. Once again, from position two to three is our boiler. Our boiler this time can be made up of an economizer, an evaporator, and a superheater. And we'll talk about each of those in a moment when we refer to our temperature entropy diagram. From three to four then, we have our turbine where we're expanding the steam and producing mechanical work. And from four to one, we have our condenser, which is used to turn our steam back into water. So let's refer to our temperature entropy diagram for this cycle. First of all, we said position one to two was as we pass through the pump. Now this time, because position one is wet saturated vapor, we can use a pump rather than a compressor. Wet saturated vapor is basically water on the point where further heating would turn it into steam. But here at position one, ideally we have wet saturated vapor or water. 
the left hand side of this curve is water. So we pump the water from position one to position two. Now note that moving from position two to position three in our boiler this time, we don't have a constant temperature process. Position two has a lower temperature on our Y axis than position three, which has a higher temperature. And the reason for this is because the heating is occurring in three stages. From position two to this point here, we're heating the water. So the economizer is used to heat the water from position two to the wet saturated vapor point at this higher temperature here. The reason the temperature here is higher than at position one is because we've increased the pressure through the pump. So from two to here, we're moving through the economizer and we're heating that water until it reaches its boiling point or its wet saturated vapor point here. Next we have the evaporator and what the evaporator does is turn our wet saturated vapor into dry saturated vapor. This section of the heating here does occur at constant temperature because when we have the change of state from wet saturated vapor to dry saturated vapor that occurs at the same temperature or at a constant temperature. Here we have a dryness fraction of 0% and here we have a dryness fraction of 100%. We're essentially evaporating the steam or turning it from wet saturated vapour to dry saturated vapour. Now to the right of the curve here is the superheated region. So from this point here or the dry saturated vapour point to position 3 we're superheating the steam. So the superheater in our boiler is being used to superheat the steam. So what we've done there is we've put a lot more enthalpy into our steam. So when we expand our steam from position three to position four, we're going to produce more mechanical work. Note that at position four here, we do have wet steam, but the dryness fraction of that wet steam is very high. So although there is some moisture content in that steam, it's considerably lower than when we use the Carnot cycle. So a couple of things to know about our ideal ranking cycle. The efficiency is lower when compared to the Carnot cycle. And the reason for that is because we don't have constant temperature. The temperature of the water entering the economizer is below the saturation temperature or below the temperature where the change of state is going to occur. And the temperature of the steam exiting the superheater is higher than that saturation temperature or the temperature where the state changes. So the fact that we don't have constant temperature affects the efficiency of our cycle. But the advantage of this particular cycle is we have a much higher net power output. As we saw on the previous slide, by superheating the steam, it's going to have a very high value of enthalpy. And when we expand the steam through the turbine and we recover that enthalpy, in doing so, we're going to create mechanical work or power output. The other advantage that we saw is because we have wet saturated vapor exiting the condenser, we can use a pump rather than a compressor. And the other advantage is because we have primarily dry steam, it reduces corrosion on the turbine blades. So although we have wet steam exiting the turbine, it has a much higher dryness fraction than when the Carnot cycle is used. So what practical modifications can be done to our ideal ranking cycle in order to improve the efficiency? Well, here we have a ranking cycle with a reheat. And the basis of this is exactly the same. We have a pump from one to two. We move through our boiler, two to three, and we go through our first turbine, three to four. But what we do this time is we expand the steam through a high pressure turbine from positions three to four. We then reheat that steam by passing it back through the boiler before we go through a lower pressure turbine from positions five to position six. So we have high pressure steam first of all, and when we expand that steam, its pressure drops. We then reheat the steam at constant pressure, so at the new lower pressure, and then we expand the steam through a lower pressure turbine before it enters the condenser. So what are the advantages of doing this? Well, if we refer to our TS diagram then, positions one to two is the same as before, and two to three is the same as before. But this time, from position three to position four, we expand the high pressure steam until it becomes lower pressure steam, and then we reheat the steam to roughly the same temperature as it was at position three. The difference this time is the pressure's lower, 
The reason the pressure is lower is because we've expanded the steam, which reduces the pressure, and then we've reheated at constant pressure. So our pressure at position five must be lower than at position three. Now we can expand the steam again through our low pressure turbine. And as we expand our steam through our low pressure turbine, we're able to recover even more enthalpy from that steam. But that isn't the only advantage here. The other advantage is that at position six, we can control the dryness fraction of that steam. The steam moving through the high pressure turbine from positions three to position four is superheated steam, so we don't have the problems with corrosion there. But the lower pressure turbine moving from position five to position six does end up being wet steam. But the advantage of using this reheat is we can control the dryness fraction of that steam in order to achieve an optimal dryness fraction. Moving from position six to position one is once again our condenser, where we're returning our high dryness fraction steam back to wet saturated steam here at position one. So some of the advantages of using a reheat, or multiple reheats if we prefer, is that we can get higher efficiencies when compared to the ideal ranking cycle. It's important to note that the efficiency will never be as high as the Carnot cycle, because the Carnot cycle represents the absolute maximum efficiency from steam power plant, but we can improve the efficiency on the ideal ranking cycle. We can also make use of something called heat regeneration to improve efficiency, and I'll return to the previous slide in order to talk about this a little bit more in a moment. We can generate a higher net power output at that given maximum temperature because we're expanding the steam multiple times. And as we mentioned before, we can control the dryness fraction of the steam in the turbine and further reduce the effects of corrosion on the turbine blades. So let's return to what we mean by heat regeneration and look at how this might improve efficiency. So we noted that all of the steam leaving the boiler enters our high pressure turbine. And we said that that steam passes back through the boiler and we made the assumption that all of that steam went into the low pressure turbine. But regenerative heating would occur somewhere around here. Because what we can actually do is we can bleed some of that steam off. And by bleed some of that steam off, we mean we separate it. And some of the steam would continue to go through our low pressure turbine. But some of that steam could be mixed with the water that's leaving our pump. Now let's think for a moment what the advantage of doing that would be. Well, the steam at position four has a higher temperature than the water at position two. So if we were to allow the steam to mix with the water, then that would increase the temperature of the water at position two. Now recall that moving from position two to this point here required the use of our economizer. And regenerative heating can decrease the amount of heat energy we need to put in at the economizer because what we're doing is we're mixing some of that hot steam with the colder water to increase its temperature. If we can decrease the amount of heat energy we need to put into the cycle, then we can increase the thermal efficiency of the cycle. So another advantage of having the steam expanded through multiple turbines is that when we have the high temperature steam leaving our high pressure turbine at position four, we can regenerate some of that heat and decrease the amount of heat that we need to input into the cycle. The reason we can't regenerate the heat from the low pressure turbine here is because the temperature of the steam at position six here is actually lower than the temperature of the water at position two. So there would be no advantage with mixing that steam with the water exiting the pump because it would actually cool that water down. And that isn't what we want to do. However, with the steam exiting the high pressure turbine, the temperature at position four is higher than the temperature at position two. So there's a benefit there to mixing some of the bled steam in order to decrease the required heat into the cycle. So as we mentioned, there's a couple of ways the reheat can improve the efficiency. Firstly, because we can produce more power output, but also because we can reduce the required heat input. So just to summarize then, in this video, we've looked at steam power plant and we've looked at the components and devices that are used in a steam power plant system. We've also looked at some different steam cycles and we've talked about some of the characteristics of each of those cycles. We have the Carnot cycle, which produces the highest theoretical efficiency, but we saw that there were some problems with that particular cycle. We looked at the ideal ranking cycle, which uses superheated steam, which when expanded through the turbine causes less damage to the turbine through corrosion.
And in addition, we're using a pump to move water rather than a compressor to compress steam. And finally, we looked at a modification to the ranking cycle, which made use of a reheat and a second stage turbine, and hence improving the thermal efficiency of that particular steam cycle.